I think that the creation of one's individual self always happens within the context of relationships. So talking about one's self-interest outside of the context of relationships, to me, is a bit of a non sequitur. It's like, what, what are my interests outside of my relationships? Do, do they even exist? Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 26th episode of the show. Before we begin, here's your historical insight of the month. The day was January 6th, 1907, when Emma Goldman was arrested by New York City's anarchist police squad for the public expression of incendiary sentiments. That's right, the anarchist police squad, which is to say, a group of cops hyper-focused on the crime of anarchism. As a political dissident, Goldman was no stranger to harassment from the cops and was arrested on multiple occasions for charges including incitement to riot, open air speaking, inciting the assassination of President McKinley, being a suspicious person, incendiary articles and incitement to riot, attempting to speak, planning to speak, speaking, conspiracy against the government, arrival in San Diego, distributing birth control information, lecturing on birth control, conspiracy to violate the Draft Act, and questionable immigration status. But it was in this month, over 100 years ago, that Emma Goldman attempted to lecture on false and true conceptions of anarchism and was caged for it. The case would later be dismissed, but we would be doing her a grave injustice if we didn't broadcast her ideas until the end of time. So in her own words, this is what she claimed to be the true conception of the criminal idea known as anarchism. Anarchism, the great leaven of thought, is today permeating every phase of human endeavor. Science, art, literature, the drama, the effort for economic betterment, and every fact, every individual and social opposition to the existing disorder of things is illumined by the spiritual light of anarchism. It is the philosophy of the sovereignty of the individual. It is the theory of social harmony. It is the great surging living truth that is reconstructing the world and that will usher in the dawn. For the second installment of 2021, We'll be speaking with a passionate and unique thinker whose approach to political philosophy is both charming and challenging. Today we'll be exploring his perspective on egoism, spirituality, anarchist tactics, and much more. Without further ado, here's my interview with Alex McHugh. Alex McHugh is the coordinator at the Center for a Stateless Society. He's a market anarchist and an activist based in Philadelphia who's interested in community building, mutual aid, the importance of civic institutions, and mysticism. Alex McHugh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Joel. I'm excited to be here. As folks may know, Joel has joined the podcast team over at Center for a Stateless Society as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to you know work with you, talk with you more. Um, and kicking it off with a conversation tonight. Awesome. Thank you. I'm looking forward to working with you too. There, there's already so much overlap between our and our political circles. You know, I guess it only makes sense that we combine efforts in some way. Yeah. And it, it's probably worth saying uh, when we got the idea of doing some podcasts out of C4SS, non servium was what we were looking to as, you know, that's what left libertarian podcasting looks like. Um, wow. So it's cool to be on the the show that, you know, for me and a lot of the other folks on the team sort of defines good podcasting in our political space. 
Wow, that's that's very flattering. Huge fantasy for us, so that means a lot. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we're, of course, very excited to produce some things together and, uh, yeah, learn from you everything that uh, that you've learned in doing the non-Servium stuff for so long. Awesome. Well, I, I, I'm stoked to collaborate. Hey, well, slightly off subject, but I was scrolling through Twitter earlier and um, it looks like you got married. Yeah, um, I got married last night. Mazel tov. <laughs> Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my partner and I had started planning our wedding uh, last spring, expecting to get married this fall. And you can imagine what happened with that. We we actually got lucky in that we hadn't put any money down or like booked anything with any finality. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so we yeah, we didn't have to cancel anything and, and lose deposits or anything. But uh, we got tired of uh, not being married and having a pandemic in the way. And so we, uh, yeah, we ended up just doing a self-uniting marriage, which you can do here in Pennsylvania. And there's about 10 other states, I think, which we're going to talk about Quakerism later. Mm-hmm. But that's uh, that's something that exists because Quakers don't take oaths to, uh, you know, you can't sign state documents as a Quaker. And so, wow. yeah, so they allow you to do a self-uniting marriage in Pennsylvania as well as a few other states because of that legacy. but. You know, it works out really well for anarchists and political radicals as well. Right. You know, it was kind of cool to be able to just say, you know, by the power vested in us and our witnesses. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. In Texas, it was called a declaration of marriage. That's what happened with, with me. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it was, it was a similar thing. We just went up and we we're like, hey, when I ask for asking for permission, we're letting you know that we got married. <laughs> so give us the tax benefits. Yeah, yeah. We're just letting you know you got to charge us differently. And uh, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, as we mentioned in your intro, you are now the coordinator for C4SS. How, how's that been going for you so far? Yeah, it's been really exciting. I mentioned this on uh, Logan Glitterbomb's show, The Green Market Agorist, as well. But this has been a long time coming. I've been talking to folks at C4SS. I was, I was the editing coordinator before this. And through that, I had started picking up some of the other work as well. You know, this is a a project that I care deeply about. It was an intellectual home for me after I left the sort of mainstream libertarian movement and was trying to figure out where to go. uh, Because I knew I knew I wasn't a communist. I knew I wasn't fully on that side of the left. But I also you know, no longer felt comfortable being in the sort of Cato. I was working at Students for Liberty, Institute for Humane Studies, that sort of movement world. And there's a lot of people who I still respect and appreciate who are still in that world. But yeah, C4SS was a place where one could still talk about price theory, could still talk about spontaneous order. And my undergraduate work was in economics and in Austrian economics, particularly. Sure. Um, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't want to give that up. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to focus more on the radical implications of that on yeah, questions about uh, fighting fascism in particular. That was a, a big motivating factor actually in me leaving the libertarian movement was feeling like there wasn't enough being done to address fascist entryism, to prevent it from happening, to remove fascists once they had, you know, infiltrated these organizations. And of course, the approach at C4SS is there's lots of different tactics for fighting them, but you certainly don't uh, just let them come to your party and be part of the movement and sure. get away with uh, with entryism. So yeah, that, that was a big motivating factor, The especially, so this all happened This all happened uh, in 2017, right after Trump was inaugurated. And I realized, along with, I think, a lot of other people, that this was a major change in the political landscape and uh, needed to be addressed and was something that we should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of libertarians um, didn't see it that way. Right. Coming from that world somewhat also, I often look back and try to figure out whether or not the difference between us now, have I been the one that's changed or were they Mm. always that bigoted and I just never realized or something? 
I think, you know, I think a lot of them were good at hiding it. I think particularly in the more intellectual areas of libertarianism, you got this sort of uh, sophisticated racism that was easy to say, well, maybe he wasn't really saying that, you know, maybe I just misunderstood. Maybe, you know, maybe these people, you know, don't, (laughs) maybe these people have economic reasons or political theory reasons that they're defending these things. And those are the reasons they cite when you ask them. But I think it was always the case that those reasons were cover Mm -hmm. for, oh, these, these people are tied into white supremacy or Additionally, there's a there's a weird niche of the libertarian movement that's uh, really into traditional Catholicism, which is something I never really understood why that was a thing. But that was also a, a thing that I, I saw start to come up more and in more serious ways where it was like, oh, actually, these people really are against abortion. And it's that, that one in particular, I think, is odd because, you know, there's some libertarian Catholics who I respect their position of, I would never personally do this. I think it's it's wrong for me, but I would also never, you know, advocate for bans or mm-hmm. anything like that. But yeah, and then you have uh, some of them who, who started to get into the like, no, we should ban this and supporting right. Trump for that reason. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, it's funny what you can get away with, with the words, um, well, as long as we have a state. Right. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And and that's exactly what they were doing is if the state's going to influence culture, we want it to promote traditional culture, which is, from a libertarian standpoint, doesn't, it makes as little sense as having a state that promotes progressive culture. Like, you shouldn't want either. And I, I feel like it's also important to note, and I talk about this a little bit in the piece I wrote about the events last Wednesday, the Capitol coup attempt. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote a little bit about libertarians who supported Trump on the basis of thinking that he was an anti-war president, or at least more so than Hillary Clinton would have been. I think there's some of them that are still on that bandwagon and ignoring the fact that he backed out of the agreement with Iran around nuclear weapons, which I think was a, I think was a force for stability in the world and the, the backing out of it didn't make any policy sense. I think it was very clearly a, a sort of a spiteful, ill-considered move. And, you know, part of the reason they've been able to keep arguing for Trump being an anti-war president is that the domestic policies have been so bad that we haven't been talking as much about the drone bombings that are still continuing in the Middle East, the support for Saudi Arabia, and particularly uh, now getting involved in Yemen. He, he recently he recently said that the administration was going to declare the Houthi group in Yemen as a terrorist, supporting terrorism and as an enemy group, which, you know, is getting involved in Saudi Arabia's wars. Like that is a war president. Yeah, man, I, I, I am no soothsayer or genius, but I feel like it's pretty easy to not trust politicians and to see all of these libertarians go into this mode where, no, he's actually a peace president. I'm not just like trying to talk shit. I just like, it kind of blows my mind. I mean, George Bush ran as a non-interventionist. And if after that, <laughs> you, know, you, you think you could trust what someone says while they're campaigning? Right, right. Come on. Yeah. And I, you know, I think maybe they were right that Hillary Clinton would have been a more hawkish president. It's entirely possible. Sure. Um, but she would have been more hawkish in a more predictable way, which I am not one for stability. That is not something that I value much. But the whole t- tweeting at Kim Jong Un about you know who had more nuclear warheads and why don't you just bomb us already then like mm. that 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 is a kind of hawkishness that you know e- even I am worried about the in- unpredictability of that approach to sure. war. Sure, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, Hillary is the evil we know. <laughs> right. right. Um, well, let's sort of touch on recent events. You mentioned the mess that happened at the Capitol. What's your what's your take on that whole situation? Yeah. Uh, so I will plug my piece is called Why Far-Right Cultism is a Dangerous Game. It's up on the C4SS site right now. And I got this wrong. So we had a podcast roundtable, uh, which just our Patreon supporters can hear the roundtables. So plug, go support, <laughs> go support Mutual Exchange Radio if you want to hear this roundtable. Uh, but it's the one we released as an end-of-year review Christmas edition 
And I got this wrong. I predicted that they weren't going to try anything. There wasn't going to be any interruption of the certification of the electors. And my analysis, the reason for saying this, is that Trump had recently lost support among hardcore established neo-Nazi white supremacist groups. And this was in part because he had started to do this sort of whiny, it's not fair, you know, I'm going to go through the courts, I'm going to do lawsuits. And it wasn't, it was, he wasn't being a fascist strongman very effectively anymore. So there was a little more of a rift. Um, and we started to notice, particularly, there were some, uh, some hardcore far right groups who were denouncing the Proud Boys, who are particularly in favor of Trump. They, they like Trump more than they care about like general far right goals. So my analysis was that okay the the you know hardcore hardcore far right people don't really care about Trump being elected so much as they care about like moving the country towards you know being a, a white supremacist nation again and so they they saw him as useful uh, they saw the people who supported him as useful and I didn't think they would be willing to go all the way for their useful idiots. But what I think I got wrong is two things. I think the Trump supporters themselves were willing to do more and are more activated to violence uh, than I realized, which is bad. So, you know, I think it's fair to call it a cult. That's why I gave the piece that title. And I think it explains a little bit about why some of them were so willing to engage in violence and were so willing to turn on, you know, people that they had been supportive of until just a short time before, whether that's Mike Pence, um, you know, they turned on him a little earlier, but even in that day, you know, marching with thin blue line flags and stuff like that, and then fighting the police in in some instances, killing one police officer in one instance, it it was a bit of a sudden turn. And I I think that was unprecedented uh, for a lot of those people too. And that comes from the experience of like, you know, going to uh, counter demonstrations of far right things and being able to tell apart the, you know, Trump supporting grandpa who got brainwashed by Fox News and the guy who's actually a Klansman, you know, they act differently. But, you know, I, I, I guess the the Trump people have gotten uh, worried enough, scared enough. I don't know. And this is this is a piece that we'll probably talk about more extensively as well. But I have a piece in our Fighting Fascism book called A Meditation on Violence. And in that, I, I speak extensively about some of the psychology of violence and, and fear and why, you know, fascists tend to have this sort of violent outlook about the world. So, yeah, I guess the, the psychology of violence had, you know, gone farther than I thought it had for them. And then we did also see the, the hardcore folks show up uh, on Wednesday in ways that I thought they wouldn't. And I, I don't think it has all that much to do with them liking Trump personally. I'm going to stick by that analysis that they don't care that much about him. But I don't think it was so much a question of, oh, am I going to do this difficult thing for the Trump people as mm-hmm. they wanted an opportunity to do something like storm the Capitol or hang a senator or something like that. And they're just continuing to use this wave of, you know, I, I think somewhat brainwashed, formerly just GOP people, Tea Party people, I think in particular. And they said, all right, well, if we get enough of these folks together, we can we can do some real violent shit. And those are those are the people who, you know, the one guy who had zip ties and clearly was intent on taking hostages, you know, some of them, some of them knew what they were doing. And one of the things I point out in this piece on far-right cultism is some of the similarities between this uprising and stuff that's been happening on the left, which is that just like in any leftist, you know, you get a a spectrum of people. There's part of the idea of diversity of tactics relies on there being uh, moderate liberals who are just there to hold signs, you know, and to create a crowd and to create a attention and all of that. And then people who are interested in in doing other kinds of direct action do that in conjunction with mass protest. And it seems the right has learned how to do that now. And that's not good. (laughs) That's very scary. So I I got that wrong. 
Yeah, so I think I was wrong, you know, in two in two ways, both in that the fascists are more willing to work alongside the Trump people more comfortably and more closely, and in that the Trump people, the sort of Fox News grandpas and whatever, are more willing to be violent. And I think part of that has a lot to do with the QAnon conspiracies and the ways in which those have used like literal cult manipulation tactics to get people really bought into this stuff. But my biggest point, you know, my biggest point in that piece is that I am concerned both about the propensity for fascist action like this to continue to happen, but I'm also worried about the response of the state, the response of the Biden administration whether we're going to see counterterrorism laws that affect anarchists as well, whether we're going to see military crackdowns that, you know, lead to rights violations and other problems. So I'm worried about both sides. And I think we should be really careful about doing things like advocating for aggressive responses if this happens again on Inauguration Day, as well as working with police and the FBI in particular on doxing some of these folks. That's something I've, I've seen a lot of leftists engaging in. And I think there's, I think it's appropriate to spread this information. You know, I think it's appropriate to share. A lot of information was leaked off of Parler in particular recently. It was revealed that they don't scrub location data. Yeah, uh, from yeah, I saw images. that. Yeah, yeah. And so some people have been using this just to put pressure on fascists in their local community or let you know let folks know um which i think is totally appropriate other people have been sending this to law enforcement and i am worried about that i don't think that's a good idea at all yeah that's that's wild i mean i hate to say it but you know some people let the true colors show at times like this you know if you're cooperating with heads of state with with the fbi with intelligence agencies that's just that's way too far or feeling sorry for cops you know there's a a whole host of things (laughs) you know like Feeling sorry for cops was not one of the problems I had with the attempted coup. No, not at all. And, it, you know, it's probably worth saying, I think the evidence is quite strong that a lot of them were on board with it. You know, a lot of them abandoned their posts on purpose. There was a lack of preparation on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, to me, goes to show, well, yeah, we can't expect them to hold these people accountable. Right. Because even if they're not openly in support of it, a lot of them are in support of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I figure we could probably talk about this all day, but we have, I have got so many interesting questions uh, set up for you that's related to, to you more. Yeah, let's do that. So let's let's start with egoism. When we became friends on Twitter, I noticed you had the teal and black uh, flag as your as your profile picture and saw that you were an egoist in your bio. And it seems that, you know, there's as many opinions on what egoism is as there are people who identify as egoists. Mm-hmm. However, one essential theme all egoists emphasize is the central role of self-interest. How do you approach egoism and how might your position differ from someone like Max Turner? Yeah, um, so this is a great question. And I think in the in the notes you sent over, you mentioned something about egoists being poetic and m- maybe we're getting to that. But that's part of the appeal for me. You know, and I I love that teal color is just like one of my absolute favorite colors. But it's not the reason. (laughs) Same, honestly. Yeah, it's not the reason I'm an egoist. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But good aesthetics are always a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, and I I think there are some egoists, right, who who would uh, who would argue for a aesthetic based worldview. So there's there's an amoralism, right, in egoism. Some people define it as an amoralism. Some people define it as an immoralism. But long story short, the idea is that you should act in your own self-interest. And there's all kinds of different interpretations of this. So some egoists interpret this to mean you should be uh, narrowly focused on self-interest. You should only do things which help you. You should not care about other people in the world. And I personally think that's a misreading of egoism. I think it's a misreading of of even Max Stirner. Because Max Stirner does acknowledge that, like, in one's own self-interest is one's relationship with others. And particularly, like, if you want to live a happy life as a human being, you have to have some amount of harmony with people around you. We don't do well in isolation, you know? Like, it is it is part of self-interest. And yeah, so 
for me, that's the approach that I take is that my self-interest involves all of those that I have relationships with. Mm -hmm. And so I, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a looser sort of egoism than, than many people have. But I also, so the reason I, I still call myself an egoist is that I think that there is something, I, I use the word sacred. I think there is something sacred, uh, special, and worth protecting about individual autonomy. And what I mean by that is no matter what relationships you are in, there is still a level to which like you as an individual have certain rights. And so for me, it's an important philosophical foundation for things like youth liberation, for things like, you know, que questions about oppression that are embedded in our close relationships. And this idea that like, you have to respect people's individual autonomy. And it, it leads to things like preferring spontaneous organization over planned organization. And this is this is somewhere where I often butt heads with communists, right? Because I don't, I don't want to try and organize a group of people. I want to work with other individuals that I have relationships with. And so the term that a lot of egoists use, I think it comes out of Stirner, is the union of egoists, which is, you know, you organize on the basis of equal individuals coming together. And there's, there's not a collapsing of individual wills into a collective will. And so that's, that's the part that I find really important um, is I subscribe to methodological individualism in thinking about a lot of problems. And so I don't like explanations that say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that pin things on group psychology or interactions with, between groups or mm -hmm. um, identitarian politics. All of these things to me seem to collapse really important issues. And so I often have, you know, to me, this is, this is the difference between me and a Marxist is a Marxist says uh, class analysis is what's important. Everyone in the proletarian class has X, Y, and Z same interests. Yeah. And everyone in the cla capitalist class has these other interests. And I say, well, well, no, <laughs> each individual has different interests. And yeah. that needs to be baked into our plan for how to respect and empower those interests. And, it, it, you know, it matters in, in that those interests are sometimes at odds. And we need to recognize that and, and I think accept that there's, you know, even even in the ideal anarchist society, I think there is some amount of conflict. Of course. It's a matter of how we respond to that. I, I think you and I have very similar views as far as that go. Yeah, you seem to have like a, with the exception of your framing of things in the terms of rights, I think you and I have sort of like a similarity in like, like an ethical egoist approach to things. Yeah, that's a, that's a great term for it, the ethical egoism. And I, I would go so far as to say, like, I want people to be able to make bad choices, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. even immoral choices. I, mm -hmm. I want people to be able to make immoral choices um, because I don't, you know, I, I don't think there's any meaning, any meaning to it if you're... If you're bound to not do so. Yeah, right. It's like... Exactly. It reminds me of Aristotelian ethics to some extent. Mm -hmm. Which I, I've always sort of been partially influenced by somewhat also. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just add real quick. I feel like I've gone a little bit back and forth in terms of how I think about rights, about morality. You know, starting out, I think, I think many people are exposed to Aristotelian ethics as one of the earliest frameworks. I had an Aristotelian framework and then a, a sort of natural rights framework after that. And then I got interested in existentialism and egoism and had this very individualist framework. And then I got interested in phenomenology yeah. and embodiment and some of these things. And I started to have a more uh, communal sure. understanding. And now I've, I've started to go back in the other direction again, so. Interesting, well, let's definitely get into some of that here in a bit. Because I know that you're interested, like I said in your intro, in, in mysticism to some extent. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that people have with egoism is, is they point out the obvious, which is like, what do you do when something is in your self-interest, but doing that thing would harm someone else? Well, the strong egoist uh, would say, well, it doesn't matter. It's in your interest you do that thing. And I, I like to sort of add to the idea of self-interest empathy. So... When your self-interest comes in conflict with someone and actively harms them, that's when I think empathy does the rest of the work. Mm -hmm. And I really don't 
know if it's necessary to have anything more than those two things <laughs> from my perspective. <laughs> How do you, what, what do you think? I mean, I like that. I, um, you know, I think empathy is very important, but I would go even deeper. So when I got interested in phenomenology um, and some of some of those strains of thought, it changed my idea of of sort of what the ego is. And so I don't I don't think that human individuality can come about in a vacuum. So I think that the creation of one's individual self always happens within the context of relationships. So talking about one's self-interest outside of the context of relationships to me is a bit of a non sequitur. Right. Um, it's like, what, what are my interests outside of my relationships? Do, do they even exist? And I, I don't think they do, but I also don't think they exist without a conscious individual being on both sides of the relationship. So for me, there's, there's an implication of egoism, which is that if I am a sacred, you know, godlike ego, so is everybody else. And so with that comes a certain respect. And this is a little bit different from a, a natural rights framework in that I'm not saying I, th I think it is like universally wrong on some metaphysical level for anyone to do anything. But I do, you know, I, I do think that there are repercussions to the self through actions done to others. And so I, I, I think it's, it's really important to like have that respect for other egos because other egos can hurt you too. And this is, this is similar to what I was saying earlier with the, you know, what I call the more sophisticated egoist take, which is that, you know, if you're going around harming everyone around you, that's not going to be in your self-interest. Even if you're acting in ways that like harm one person, other people who see that are probably going to react badly to it. And I, I think recognizing the power of oneself is really important, but also recognizing the power of others over you um, and not necessarily over you, the power of others to to influence your life and to interact on you. And the sort of funny example I give sometimes is around theft, which is people say, you know, libertarians in particular are like, why do you think, you know, stealing is okay? Um, how, how do you have respect for each other and like harmonious society if it's okay to just like steal whenever it's in your interest? And my answer is, well, you can steal it back. You know, it, if it's so much, if it's so much in your interest that it's worth it and, and you want to, you want to risk the harm to our relationship, which I decided was worth the risk when I stole it, you steal it back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, all of that to say, I think the power of one ego is balanced by the power of other egos. Egoism only works as a as a philosophy that applies to everyone. So a lot of egoists, I think, like to be edgy or haven't uh, thought about this enough and, and get into the like, I am the most important thing. And it's like, well, no, all of the eyes are the most important is the idea. Mm -hmm. Ayn Rand comes to mind when we talk about self-interest often for people. She's often viewed as uh, being situated on the right also, but for her, she had three deadly sins, which were mysticism, altruism, and collectivism. Are you sympathetic to any of her ideas? And what's your take on her holy trinity of tendencies to avoid? So I actually am more favorable to Rand than uh, many people might guess. I didn't like Atlas Shrugged. That was a little too on the nose. And I, I think she gets the implications of her own philosophy wrong. So I think she borrowed a lot from Aristotelian ethics and from egoism. And it ends up in a very similar place to where I am. But I think she ends up overstating a lot of the a lot of the self-interest stuff and making a little uh, making it into a little bit of a caricature of what it should be. All of that said, I mean I did like Anthem and We the Living, and I think her opposition to groupthink and to group psycho like the psychology of, you know, thinking about your community as as all being the same and giving that primacy over your own interest. I think those are very dangerous things. And I think she's right to call out certain kinds of altruism as well as what was the last one? Uh mysticism, altruism, and collectivism. Okay, yeah. So collectivism and altruism. I agree with her. You know, I, I think collectivism as a methodological approach is dangerous and flawed. 
I think it collapses a lot of very important differences in context. And I, yeah, I think altruism can be very misguided and that in the modern world, especially the modern world that she was critiquing, progressive movements in particular, altruism is largely a cover, right? It's, it's, it's a PR thing. It's about making oneself feel better. It's about, uh, you know, the progress of the nation. I, I think she was right to call out that sort of altruism altruism for the sort of virtue signaling sake, right? And one of the things that comes to mind is uh, there's a great uh, study that was done in Canada on people who are really interested in environmentalism. And essentially what they found is there's this whole group of people who will recycle every single thing that they can and go above and beyond to be very, very green. And then they put these people in like stressful situations. And they found that the people who do more to try and be environmentally correct, which is to say nothing of whether this is effective. Put all of that aside. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah. Put all of that aside. But the people who try really hard to do the right thing and check off all the boxes in those ways, in the in the sort of conspicuous ways, when they're in a lab and an assistant is late or something, like in these experiments where they set them up in these stressful situations, they're rude to people in person and they snap at you and they think less highly of other people and there's all of these things that show like it's a lot more about saying to yourself i am a good person mm -hmm. uh, I, than it is about you know being a good person if you if you had asked me to predict that outcome i i probably would have put my money on what you just said yeah i i, I felt very vindicated uh when i read that because <laughs> you we've all met a vegetarian who is like that <laughs> absolutely i'm i'm vegetarian but I adopted it by seeing someone else who had this diet and never once asked me to adopt it mm. or forced me to or, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I have nothing against vegetarianism. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But yeah. So out of the two out of the three, I think I'd say I agree with her. And the, the last one of mysticism, I don't. <laughs> I think mysticism is very important to individual self-determination in particular. Well, let's definitely go into that then, because that seems to be, interestingly enough, like a common thing amongst some egoists. You you said it earlier, but there's this tendency towards the poetic within a lot of egoism. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's also sometimes, you know, they go even further and express interest towards mysticism, despite the damnation of such tendencies and the works of many major egoist thinkers. How do you, how do we make sense of this? And what is it that draws you towards these seemingly counterintuitive inclinations? Yeah, pers so personally, I don't think egoism works particularly well without additional philosophical supports. And different people have different supports that they put in. So Ayn Rand, you know, I was just talking about, I think she fills it out with the Aristotelian ethics, those sort of virtue ethics, you should work hard and blah, blah, blah. Others fill it out with uh, nihilism, right? Others fill it out with existentialism. And so I, I don't think it's that weird that there are some people who have filled it out with religious approach or a mystical approach. And yeah, so Max Stirner in particular, very opposed to religion and mysticism in, in that sort of... Uh, somewhat cringy now, I guess, new atheist way is, is how is what I think of. But, you know, to me, I think the more important critique was the critique of institutionalized religion, the critique of a group of people saying, this is what's right, and this is how we do it, and you have to do it that way, and you have to believe X, Y, and Z. That's something I, I don't know how common it is for egoists to care about this, but I see it come up fairly often is I'm particularly concerned about attempts to regulate or control thought. I don't, you know, thought crime, future crime, any of that kind of stuff is the scariest thing to me. That's that's the biggest issue that could potentially happen. But this egoist idea that one's mind should be free of manipulative influences, including in Max Stirner's reading, religion. I don't think that all Spirituality and mysticism is uh, totalizing in, in that way. And so, you know, there are other egoists as well who, are, who have a mystical approach to it. And the way that I would lay this out is so I was just saying, you know, I got very interested in this sort of phenomenology, phenomenological idea of 
the self arising through one's relationship with others. But I do think that there's there's this other part of the self that is separate from others, right? It's unique. It's powerful. It can influence the world in a way that is not just reflective of ways in which it's been influenced. So like you might call this consciousness, you might call it individuality, you might call it an ego. But I think it does still leave this question of how did that come to be? And that is a that is a question that obviously is still being debated by many, many philosophers, and it is not a settled question, and it's very complicated. But to me, it makes sense that the the only way I can see that arising is through a relationship with an entity that is more powerful than humans. And so to me, that's divinity, right? And I, I don't make a whole lot of claims about what divinity looks like or does or how it functions or what it is. To me, it is just there is this higher consciousness of some kind that we have some sort of a relationship with. And through that relationship, develop a self that is unique from the influences of other humans around us and powerful, right? It has the ability to influence the world in ways that I think are important. I, I guess basically what I'm saying for philosophy people, I think that humans have ontological effects in the world. We're not just affected by it and, and sort of experiencing, um, but we actually have power to change things on a fundamental level. And I don't see where that power would come from, except for this, you know, relationship to divinity, this relationship to something that is more conscious than us. <laughs> yeah, that I think that scares people often. I think that for a lot of people that is it's spooky and it's foreign. Mm -hmm. So it and, you know, from like a materialist standpoint or whatever, there's if there's no empirical data for it, then why believe it? Yeah, my tendency yeah. is to default towards that. I mean, I am agnostic, but mm. you mentioned egoist thinkers who were also mystical. Robert Anton Wilson comes to mind for me. I mention him probably too often on this show, but it's through him that I became familiar with uh, Kabbalah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, learning more about it has been a part-time interest of mine for a few years now. And I find many of the concepts within Kabbalah play well with egoism and anarchist ideas in interesting ways. Like, for instance, like one aspect of it I find that I find fascinating, sort of along the lines with what you're already saying, is, and there's all sorts of different denominations, I'm sure, as you know, too, within, the, within Kabbalah and interpretations of it. But within some interpretations, there is a spiritual goal of harmonizing the will to receive, or egoism, with the will to bestow which some frame as altruism, which seems to me that it would lead one to have an attitude of reciprocity that treats others with dignity and respect. And I've always found that mm. kind of charming in its own way and uh, compatible with anarchism. Are there any ideas within, because I know you're specifically interested in Jewish mysticism also, are there any ideas within Jewish mysticism that you think other anarchists would benefit from learning more about? Yeah, so I will admit I'm not particularly well equipped uh, to answer this question. I am not I'm not a Kabbalist and I don't have I don't have a whole lot of like expertise on established forms of mysticism. Like a true egoist, my approach to mysticism is to find things that resonate with my ego and do those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so that comes from a, a variety of different traditions. But before we go into that, I do want to just note the way in which you were just talking about uh, Robert Anton Wilson and the Kabbalism that comes out of his work and similar work is somewhat similar. There are differences, of course, but there is another strain of thought, Levian Satanism, mm. uh, which a lot of people like to say is like if Ayn Rand was a religion. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to bring that up because I, I think that's an accurate reading of it. Right. And it it kind of is like this combination of sort of randian egoism uh with some mystical ideas you know and the, the idea of the sacredness of the self and the individual and all this stuff you know it doesn't particularly resonate with me so that's that's not one that i find a lot of interest in but i i do think it is an interesting mix of those two things in a way that works surprisingly well you know but yeah as far as 
mystical ideas that I think anarchists should know about. Um, yeah, I think probably the probably the wildest sort of mystical stuff, <laughs> wildest sort of mystical stuff that I believe in is that I think individuals have a lot more power to act on the world in that way that I was just talking about than most people realize. And so I mean that both in the sort of like self-determination sense of like, you do own your own destiny, like you really can wake up tomorrow and do things completely differently and no one can stop you. But I also think that like, we have abilities to communicate with each other in ways that are nonverbal, that people don't often put much effort into. I have played around with some like astral projecting and stuff like that, lucid dreaming and all of that. And so I, I think that it's fascinating, you know, and I, I'm not going to pretend that I've like learned anything definitive or worth passing on, but I would recommend experimenting with it. I think it's a, it's a good way to understand your own mind better and, and explore the self, even if you don't think anything mystical is going on there. But yeah, I, I think that sort of communication experimentation is important. I try to look out for and be in conversation with divinity. And that means, you know, that can mean all sorts of different things. That can mean noticing things which I feel are signs of some sort and acting in that way. Or that can mean, uh, you know, using blessings at times when they're appropriate. And so this is, uh, this is where Judaism comes into it, is that that is the tradition that I am part of in community. Mm -hmm. And that partially became a thing because my wife is Jewish and we have plans. We have plans to raise children together uh, and we are part of a, a Jewish collective here in Philadelphia. So part of it is that's what my community is doing to recognize divinity. So that's what I'm going to be doing. But I also really appreciate the very specific and well laid out system of blessings that Judaism has. Like it, it really you can tell that there have been centuries of thought put into what you say when for which things. And I, I really appreciate that. I previously, so I grew up Christian. I was raised in the Protestant church. I was practicing as a Quaker most recently before my decision to convert. I should say I'm not fully converted yet. Uh, so mm -hmm. I know different different people have different views on that. <laughs> so disclaimer, that is not official yet. But, you know, one of the things I got frustrated with in the Christian theological and philosophical approach was a sort of blanket approach of, well, Christ's love fixes everything. And so in any situation, right, you're praying to Christ for Christ's love and protection. And there's no, you know, there's no recognition of like, this is a scary time. This is an exciting time. This is, there is some, you know, there is some, but it's, it's a lot of the same prayer you know, the Lord's Prayer or the same songs or, you know, uh, to me, it felt like a, a less, a less well-developed approach of, you know, oh, you got a problem, throw some Christ's love on that instead of like, you know, like I said, centuries and uh, millennia, actually, mm -hmm. of thinking through what needs to be said right now about this problem, what needs to be said to celebrate this thing. And to me, that, that, you know, gives the rituals more power is that they're contextual. You know, they reflect daily life. They reflect duties, I guess, that I feel like I have anyway. So they feel, they feel enmeshed with my personal interest, right? My personal interest is to, you know, have a good marriage with my wife and get along with my community and all of these things. And I feel like the traditions and rituals of Judaism are well set up and, and are explicitly set up to show you how and allow you to do those things instead of being more about this sort of abstract belief, you know? For sure. And it, it does, I think it also leaves a little bit more space for intellectual debate, you know? Like, I think there's a, a much more active Jewish intellectual tradition because, you know, you can you can talk about these things and you can debate beliefs right you can't really debate belief in christianity you mm -hmm. believe or you're not a christian <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah it's uh since i've sort of started i guess investigating it it's it struck me as like just so reasonable in so many ways like you start off with like i won't get into it actually i feel like i'm gonna go into a rabbit hole but basically like we don't see reality as it exists but as it pertains to our survival right 
So if we start out there, we can admit that it's possible that there's like this illusory element to reality. Mm -hmm. If that's true, and I know you're not a Kabbalist, but like Kabbalah says that like the true reality is what goes beyond the illusion. Mm. And that, I mean, that part of it, yeah, that part of it, I would agree with. There's something more than we can see. I, I think this is actually a really good time to bring up this other idea that I, I want to get into, which is the phenomenological creation of the self, embodiment, and, and some of those ideas. So one of the things I've been most interested in recently is Saul Newman's work around post-anarchism. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so his approach to post-anarchism is looking at this question of I think he I think he refers to it as Lacanian space, but this idea of a central void, mm -hmm. uh, which is a creative void, and the idea that creation comes out of voids, yeah, uh, and, and and things where and and not and lack right. So the Lacanian term of lack is is one that he brings up a lot, um, and and the lack is a is a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. Emptiness of space is possibility. And so to me, this is, this is where mysticism exists, right? There are things we don't know and we can't see. Clearly something is happening and creation happens from somewhere, you know? And so I think he's really onto something in terms of talking about what is the creative self. The creative self is our lack. It's our possibility. It's, it's what we're not yet. Um, and it's our difference with others. Mm -hmm. And so that brings it all the way back to this, you know, this idea that comes out of, comes out of the continental school of thought. And a, a lot of the later Marxists, I think Marxist postmodernists were into some of these ideas, but th this idea that there is no self without relation to the other, and that the, the self is a reflection of how you are different from the other. And I actually, I wanted to recommend, uh, there's a book by John Roussan, it's called Bearing Witness to Epiphany, Persons, Things, and the Nature of Erotic Life. And he means erotic in the philosophical sense as different and exciting, not necessarily sexual. But I really, I really appreciated this. And this was the book that got me thinking in a more communal direction and got me thinking about how selves arise from our relationship with others mm -hmm. and things like that. But I think there's a tie in here. I think, <laughs> bear with me. I think that there's a tie in in, you know, going through some of this. Why does it look like there's nothing before there's the relationship? So he's kind of pointing out that these, re these selves only really exist as a part of a relationship, but we exist prior to our relationships. Like th there's a physical world that we're in mm -hmm. and that's prior to relationships. And so there's, there's something there, but we can't see it and we can't really name it. And this is where I think you can then hop over to the the sort of Saul Newman post-anarchism and say, yeah, the part that exists pre-relationship is void. And void is creation, is divinity, is God. And so every human being has a little piece of divinity in them in that they have void. They have possibility. They have not, they have things that don't exist yet. Mm. Um, and that non-existence is creativity. And to me, so I, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm trying to draw the similarity between where this Lacanian post-anarchism is going in terms of thinking about what is the self, um, and where mysticism goes in terms of thinking about what is divinity. And those look very, very similar. And that's the foundation of my religious egoism, mm -hmm. you know, is each individual is an individual only because and in that they have void they have possibility and if they have that they are divinity and so with that comes you know i think certain certain respect and certain power interesting i uh, i think even if you look at everything you've said as like a metaphor it could still be useful <laughs> yeah yeah so for people who are a little bit less uh a little bit less into lsd <laughs> I was I was very into that for for a while, but I'm almost thirty, so I've calmed down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's good at, it's good at getting you out of reality tunnels. Yeah, yeah. Or 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 or, or, or experimenting in other ones. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So, 
that that's been fascinating. I do want to move along a little bit because I have some other questions for you. Not entirely related, but I do want to circle back around to something you mentioned earlier about theft. Yeah. So in an article you wrote titled In Defense of Small Business on the price gouging slash looting debate, you argue that the value of emergency pricing is in its rational allocation of scarce resources. Can you break down what this means in in practical language? Yeah, yeah, totally. I had to go reread this because I I didn't remember this debate so clearly. But yeah, so towards the beginning of the pandemic, there was a discussion about price gouging again. Um, Because folks on the progressive left really hate price gouging. They think it's evil and capitalist and stops people from uh, being able to get what they need. Um, Libertarians favor it, and they give two arguments for it. The first argument they give is that price gouging prevents uh, misallocation of resources by signaling to consumers that the resource has become more scarce. So what this means, the classic example given, is that when price gouging happens on, say, ice, Maybe after a big storm, the power goes out and ice uh, shoots up in price. This is good because it means that people who just want to chill their beer, it won't be worth it to them to buy ice. And so there will be more ice left over for people who need to, say, chill insulin or a medication um, or something that's of higher value uh, than chilling beer. So that's the one libertarian argument. The other argument they give is that increased prices in a particular region influence uh, producers outside of that region to send more of that resource into the region. Um, And so the way this happens is, uh, say there's a hurricane, the power goes out, there's not enough milk at the grocery store because it's all gone bad, prices shoot way up. If you're a milk producer in the next county over and you have power, it's going to be worth it to you now to sell your milk in the next county over. And this is good not only in that it incentivizes people to do that, but that it covers things like the additional transportation cost. So long story short, I think the libertarians are right about the second one. Uh, The counter argument that some anarchists have given to the first argument is that it only works if it only works in preventing the misallocation of resources on the local scale if individuals have the same situation, right? So if we all have the same income and the price of ice shoots way up, I'm not going to buy ice to chill beer, but someone might buy it to chill medicine. But this this changes, right? If I make a hundred times as much income as someone down the street, it might still be worth it to me to spend that money on chilling beer. Mm-hmm. So I think the anarchists are, are right uh, that in a world with significant uh, income inequality, it doesn't actually stop local resource misallocation. I, I think that's that's a point that uh, William Gillis has made a couple of times, and I, I think they're right on that. But I, I think the libertarians are correct that you do need to preserve the price signal to some extent, because that's what incentivizes and allows resources to flow in from other regions. Mm-hmm. It's important as a communication tool. And I still, you know, I still support prices as a technology. I think they're incredibly important. And, uh, you know, increase our standard of living quite a lot. It's a it's a communication technology yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Most I mean I think I think most people's responses is, is to to price gouging is like these assholes are are upping the price on things when people need it most. Yeah. What about poor people who don't have money? I mean as you you kind of addressed this already, but what what would be your reaction to someone who just has this 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 seemingly righteous emotional response to Someone not being able to get access to this because this asshole raised the price while they don't have money. They don't have any money to buy it to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. There's actually one part I forgot to mention earlier. I titled this in defense of small business in part because I think that this the price gouging approach works a little bit better when you have small mom and pop shops where the prices can still be raised generally. So you can still price gouge generally, and then you can make exceptions for the people in your community who can't afford those prices and who have legitimate needs. Um, And so, yeah, if we had, you know, 
a shop that my friend ran who knew everybody in the neighborhood and the clerk was the same person as the owner, the clerk can then make a snap decision as, you know, since they're the same person as the owner, you don't have to pay the higher price. I know, you know, I know you're, you know, maybe someone who's disabled in the community and you don't have income and so you don't have to pay. The problem is that in our current society, we have these huge mega corporations. Mm. And so if a clerk at Walmart decides not to charge somebody for something, there's no there's no way to get sign off on that, right? Like you can't go all the way up the chain and back down. It, mm. It's just it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't happen. There's no room for mutual aid within within uh, within capitalism. Yeah, to, to think, that extent or in that way. I think, yeah, and I think it's it's specifically a scale problem where the corporations we have are too big to make exceptions, and so general price increases or you know general shifts in price in normal times that maybe shouldn't apply to everyone have to apply to everyone because we have a one size fits all contextless behemoth approach to everything. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I would imagine that um, to some extent theft comes in under our, our current system because in that same article, you also argue that looting can also play a role in the rational allocation of resources under capitalism. Yeah. How does that work? Can you can you explain? I mean, because that's so counterintuitive to any right libertarian hearing this is like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Break that down for us. Yeah. Well, so it, it, it follows from what I was just saying, which is we don't have a free market. We have corporations that exist because of state subsidy that exist because of restriction of other economic actors. And as such, the market is distorted. Uh, and so in a distorted market, with the amount of income inequality that we have, with the size of corporation that we have, which I don't think would exist under a free market. I don't think that these things would look the same under an anarchist market. Because we have to deal with those things, we have to, you know, account for them. And I think looting is an absolutely appropriate means of accounting. You know, I I think a lot of the a lot of the looting that we saw happen over the summer was of consumer goods out of big box stores. That and particularly, I saw a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals get taken out of drugstores. And I thought that was incredibly appropriate because one of the most regulated and distorted industries is pharmaceuticals. You know, people can't afford their medicine because we have a convoluted and fucked up system. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, given that this is already distorted, given that my income was stolen from me or diverted from me towards these corporations, it's completely acceptable to steal it back. You know, that brings up the question, which we could probably spend an entire episode on, and I'm, I'm uh, probably don't know enough about to, to make any strong claims on, but that is like, uh, to what extent property titles as we know them, like how much of it is actually legitimate, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Some, some market anarchists would say no property titles are legitimate under capitalism or as we know them. Yeah, I think it would be hard to find one that was legitimate. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, like a lot of left-wing market anarchists thought, your work emphasizes the value of markets while also stressing a kind of class consciousness. I don't know if you'd like that framing, but to me it comes across as sort of a class consciousness Mm. that seems necessary for an effective critique of capitalism. And in another article you wrote called Don't Give a Single Inch Back, The Fight for Human Dignity Amid COVID-19, you emphasize how the pandemic has disproportionately affected marginalized people. Uh, You point out how a general strike and rent strikes, among other grassroots tactics, could be a viable tactic during such conditions. In in retrospect, do you still feel the same way? And, And how effective do you think these tactics were? to the extent that they were actually adopted. Yeah. So I think they were not effective in that they were largely not adopted. And it it was incredibly frustrating. Uh, Towards the beginning of the pandemic, I think a lot more people started to realize. So two things happened this year. The pandemic happened and we had a series of Black Lives Matter uprisings. uh, And I should say, police murders that led to those uprisings. And I think both of those things made a lot of people realize or realize more fully that the government, the state, does not care about us, does not have our best interests in mind, does not care about our safety or well-being, um, doesn't even care whether we live or die. And that, to me, is the kind of class consciousness that matters. My problem with Marxists 
and the collapse into class is looking at well so i have two problems with it the first is that i think there are other there are other differences in privilege that matter so i worry that collapse into class ignores both the role that the state plays in privileging the classes right so i i think when you collapse to class and you say the problem is the capitalist class it ignores what I think is actually doing the work there, which is the state. So that matters. And I also think that Marxists tend to get it wrong as far as which economic class to focus on. So the classic Marxist approach is to focus on the proletariat, the working poor, right? The labor class. I think the appropriate beginning of a new world is with the lumpen proletariat, is with the non-working poor, is with people who can't work Particularly, I have been encouraged to see more movements that center the voices and leadership of homeless people, of disabled people, of people who are completely cut out of the economic system. So that is that is a big difference I have as well with Marxists. And it seemed it seemed to fit. I think I think it's it seemed like a particularly good time to push for that when the pandemic began. Because what needed to happen was not better labor, right? It wasn't more jobs. It wasn't higher income for the jobs. It was, we need to not be working right now. We, we, need, to, we need to have a society that can reduce production and not have this, this sort of uh, pro, pro-industrial approach uh, that you get out of classical Marxism. And that's not to say there are Marxists who haven't considered these things. There are there are Marxists who have shifted focus to the lump and proletariat. There have Mar- there are Marxists that have shifted to the degrowth model, right? And this idea that we, we shouldn't just be increasing industrialization and, and labor power and things like that. So yeah, it's it's been disappointing to see some of these things not pan out. But what I was trying to say with that article is to the group of people who previously were more privileged and through some of these experiences realized they had more in common with people who are oppressed, I wanted them to consider, okay, how do we actually push for change? But I also I also wanted Marxists to consider a broader approach for their political projects and to not say, how can we get everyone into our socialist party or into a union or whatever? And what can we do spontaneously? This is why I was advocating for citywide rent strikes and general strikes, is that you don't organize those things through the same sort of organizational methods that a lot of Marxists prefer right now. Um, those, the, you organize those things with neighbors spontaneously. And so I was hopeful that with more people getting interested in mutual aid and radical politics, there is an opportunity to do some of that large-scale spontaneous organizing. And we did see it start to happen here in Philadelphia. It started to happen around evictions and rent strikes. We had a couple of rent strikes that got off successfully. But one of the one of the organizations, so we have a tenants union here, the Philadelphia Tenants Union. They have done some good work, but at the beginning, they said they would not support a citywide rent strike. And so a lot of people didn't go ahead with it you know, we had small strikes in neighborhoods that weren't linked up because there was not support from the institutional Marxist people in the city. And their approach was, we don't have the capacity as an organization to run a citywide rent strike. And my response was, yeah, nobody does. It's not something that that a group runs for everybody else. It's all of us as a city do it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my my big thing is, you know, trying to promote class consciousness of a very particular sort, uh, which recognizes that the state is at the root of the problem, and which recognizes that the non-working poor are as important, if not more important, than the proletariat as a as a force for revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And that, and that comes that comes partially from just having had a lot of conversations with people who are experiencing homelessness, and realizing that nobody is more aware of the ways in which the state fucks people over than they are. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you touched on something that I think is, 
is important to probably focus on, and that is the coordination problems that come with sort of these popular tactics that a lot of classical anarchists have promoted. I mean, revolution, mass strikes, etc., they become an inevitability when people become desperate, but they're hard to to coordinate otherwise. Yeah. So how do you deal with the like that coordination issue? I don't have I don't have a great answer for this um, because it's it's something I've been struggling with in doing some left solidarity organizing over the past couple of years. You know, sometimes the Marxists I'm working with went out and and I go, wow, their procedures actually work better. Sometimes I do. And I go, I'm really glad we went with my procedure because it works better. And I'm not sure, really. I, I'm not sure how you solve that coordination problem. But it's very, very difficult to get masses of different people to all work together. And that's why I have a preference for the sort of direct action that is that is uh, prefigurative or defensive. Um, and so what I mean by that is building up communities. Like I've put a lot of work into the collective that I'm part of, you know, seizing land. There's a group here in Philadelphia that has seized land back from the housing authority. And, and so I'm very focused on this build the new world first approach because that you can get enough people on the same page to start doing. And I don't think we'll be able to get mass support for anything like a revolution until a lot of that work is done. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily want there to be mass support for a revolution until that work is done. Because I think the historical record shows pretty clearly that when you have these sort of aberrational events, right, when people get desperate enough to like actually storm the Capitol, mm -hmm what replaces the old system is not a better system. Uh, and I, I think the experience of the USSR is interesting in two ways. Uh, the first is that, you know, after a mass revolution event, they didn't have institutions set up and already running to create a new society. And so trying to create a whole cloth, you end up recreating a lot of the same problems. You end up creating new problems, different kinds of authoritarianism than what you had before. But then I, I think, you know, there's also important things to be learned from the opening up of the USSR after it collapsed and uh, some of the Eastern European countries where they just said, OK, so we had socialism, we had state socialism, we have a free economy now, and we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to try to address the problems that still exist. We're just going to say, OK, whoever has money now, start spending it in the market without realizing that, like, those people were the same people who had the money under the state socialist system. And so nothing changed. And so all of that to say, I think you have to replace those underlying institutions first, or you're going to revert back to the same situation or to equally bad uh, scenarios. Right, right. So moving forward a little bit, I really enjoyed reading your article titled A Meditation on Violence. In it, you argue that even if we think violent resistance is sometimes strategically necessary, we as anarchists should not revel in it. Why'd you feel it necessary to emphasize this? Yeah, I think that is all the more necessary now than it even was at the time. But I felt that was necessary because I saw a lot of people on the left celebrating violence against folks on the right in ways that I thought were overstepping things a bit. And so what I mean by that is two two things in particular. I don't think a lot of people were were not acknowledging the fact. And th this goes back to what I was saying at the at the beginning of our interview, uh which is, you know, some of the people who support Trump are disgusting hardcore white supremacists. Some of them are brainwashed grandpas. And to me, you need to deal with those people differently. To me, it's it's not acceptable to use violence against someone who would have been convinced by nonviolence. And so I think it's important to keep asking the question, can we do this nonviolently? Can we do this in a way which minimizes violence, even if we use it in particular cases? And I think the one one thing that illustrates this difference really, really well is the violence that we saw in the capital coup attempt. Anarchists, to my knowledge, have not uh, not killed any police officers this year. And it's not because we like them or any of that. It's just that we use, we use violence defensively, right? Like the, the point of using it is to prevent more of it 
And that's the only, that to me is like the only justifiable reason for doing it. And so I, I get particularly upset at the other part of it, which is uh, retribution or punishment, which I don't, I don't think it's acceptable to use violence if you're not acting defensively and if there's not an immediate threat. And that piece, that piece confused a lot of people because some people would read it and they would say, I don't see how you can be such a pacifist. This is bullshit. And some people would read it and they'd say, I don't see how you could be so pro-violence. This is bullshit. Um, because what I was trying to tease out is when is it appropriate and when is it not? And I did that by focusing first on the non-aggression principle, which libertarians like to use mm -hmm. and saying, I think that this is not a good heuristic. I think it's an imperfect heuristic that's missing some very important things, namely that self-defense against non-immediate threats can be justified. And I think anyone who is not white in this country, anyone who is LGBT in this country, anyone who is one of the groups that is targeted by fascist hate has a right to self-defense against these people. They've made it very, very clear that they want to and will kill us if given the opportunity. And some of the times in which they were given the opportunity, they did. You know, I think the non-aggression principle gets this wrong because it tries to view violence through this lens of aggression, which asks the question, who hit first? And in a society which has structural violence, you can't determine who hit first. And some of the, some of the violence doesn't look like an individual person hitting another individual person. And so when you see an individual who is being oppressed by structural violence defend themselves violently, it doesn't look like defense if you're using the non-aggression principle. It can be it can be really hard to say, oh, okay, that actually that actually is defensive. And so I I use the example uh, of my own life in high school. So I'm a trans man, and I came out and I I was outed in high school. I did not choose to come out. People found out I was trans. That's a whole long story. But mm -hmm. I started to get into um, some fights with guys in my high school, and there was one particular time where someone came up and tried to fight me and I could have ran away, you know, like I'm real fast. I would have gotten away. He wouldn't have hurt me, mm -hmm. but I felt like it was necessary given the institution I was in, given that I was in a public high school, given that trans rights are what they are these days, or, you know, they were even worse back then. I felt like the only way to prevent this sort of thing from continuing to happen throughout all of high school was to say, yeah, I'll fight you and to beat him. And I did. And it worked. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it worked. I did mm -hmm. not get bullied. I, you know, I did have a few other fist fights with people where they said, I'm going to fight you. And I said, okay, you know, and I'm not necessarily advocating that that's the right choice for everyone. I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a case where, you know, if you just looked at the instance of the one fist fight, you would look at me and go, oh, you agreed to be part of that. Mm -hmm. That was not self-defense. You said, yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. But that's only if you don't acknowledge the context, which is I know that all of these other guys are going to try to beat me up if I right. don't show that I can fight. Yeah. Yeah, I think the non-aggression principle gets that wrong. I think it doesn't appropriately acknowledge the cyclical and contagious nature of violence. I don't think it acknowledges the role of fear in violence. And so... I think there are people who are violently right wing because they're afraid of what other violent right wingers are going to do to them if they're not. And that to me is important to acknowledge and think about and talk about. And I, I, I also talk about, I also talk about proportionality in that article a lot. And the idea that like, you know, once you've successfully defended yourself and gotten rid of the threat and all of that, this additional retributive justice doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't help anything. And that came out a lot after Kyle Rittenhouse shot those people in Kenosha, Washington, or Kenosha, Wisconsin. And a lot of people on the left were saying like, oh, I hope he gets executed. Oh, he ho I hope he gets life in prison. And I was saying, this is a 17 year old kid. He doesn't understand what he's doing. He's probably in a, in a family that is somewhat oppressive. He probably is beholden to toxic ideas of masculinity you know it, I, I don't think it's it's the right response people got to be careful with their knee-jerk carceral responses that's a slippery slope 
just inappropriate. I mean, it's just not an option on anarchist grounds, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you have time for one listener question, a lightning round, and then the, the end? Yeah, let's do it. The listener question I wanted to ask you is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Oh, geez. (sighs) I have so few solid thoughts about my imagined political utopia. (laughs) I like to approach things from the most, like, theoretical level I can and say, well, it'll have to balance these things and it'll have to um, embody this thing. But I I don't think it would be that different. Really, I think... um, I think things would be a little bit more scarce. Some things would be a little bit more scarce in an anarchist utopia. I think we would have a slightly reduced level of production and industrialization of some things. So I wouldn't, you wouldn't have a Keurig machine because those are wasteful and terrible. But you could probably, you know, it might be a little more expensive because you're actually covering the costs of the resources and not being subsidized by global trade networks and all of this bullshit, which Kevin Carson is absolutely brilliant on. So I think it'll be a little more expensive. You'll probably know the barista by name. He'll know your order and will have seen you every day in the local shop because it's not a Starbucks. It's, it's you know, this, this person makes cappuccino maybe uh, on his back porch and he's just really good at it. And so, you know, you go by your neighbor's place and buy a cappuccino from him. Yeah. All right. Hey, well, towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of ideas or people and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Yeah. All right. Yiddish anarchism. Awesome. I would love to learn more about it. I I should know more about it. I know a lot of songs that I have learned with my collective in Yiddish, but yeah, I I should learn a lot more about it. It's a more uh, social form of anarchism. Very, very, very much more social. Natural rights. I don't know whether they exist or not. This is the one I keep, it's one of the things I keep going back and forth on. I like a lot of the intuitionist, I guess they're called intuitionist approaches. Michael Humer's approach, I think, is one of the best ones. I think is one of the best defensive of natural rights existing, but I don't necessarily care if other people have different foundational moral systems than I do. That's that's the sort of egoist take is... You can believe in them if you want, and I'll have, you know, I'll have the context that matter to me. Yeah, so markets and everything, even uh, even moral laws, maybe. Nihilism. Ah, uh, I kind of hate it lately. I'm really upset at the edgier nihilist egoists who make us all look bad. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm an existentialist. Quakerism. Quakerism, I think, is lovely. It's the sect of Christianity which I have the most affinity for. I really love the anti-war activism that Quakers do. It was some of the first activism I ever did as well. Uh, And I I just always will remember the old, old Quaker dudes, like 70 years old, long white beard, who still go protest Raytheon like once a month, like chain themselves to the gate kind of shit. It's an amazing and passionate community. Yeah, and I have I have a lot of love for Quakers, even though uh, my personal theology has changed. But I mean, one of the cool things about Quakers is anyone can worship in a Quaker meeting house. So I actually, the first time I went to a Quaker meeting was with a Jewish friend. Um, mm. Yeah, so I could still go if I wanted. Okay, uh, Young Americans for Liberty. I'm so glad that Cliff finally got canned. Cliff Maloney is a spineless little slug. And one of the biggest frustrations I had in working with Students for Liberty is that we had to look, work so closely with YAL, in part because they supported much more conservative causes and the GOP, uh, which to me were not libertarian causes at all. But also because, yeah, there was rampant sexual assault in that organization and nothing was done about it. I mean, I remember telling SFL leaders to be careful around certain YAL staffers and to to watch out for each other. You know, like I remember having conversations with SFL student leaders and being like, don't, you know, let your female friends hang out with this person. Don't, you know, it it was part of the whisper networks for a decade at least. Ah, that's horrible. And I'm I'm glad to hear that, that that he's um, being called out to hopefully some accountability comes from it and some changes are made. Fucking finally. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's go to the end of our conversation here. Where should people go to learn more about your political or mystical interests? Yeah, so the best place to follow me is, of course, at the Center for a Stateless Society. Almost all of my 
writing goes up there. I do have a Patreon now, uh, which is linked to in my byline on C4SS. I'm going to start posting some more things there, including a few medium pieces I did. I have an interesting, I think it's interesting. I have an interesting medium piece advocating for individual ownership of nuclear weapons, basically saying states should not be allowed to have nukes, but non-states should. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'll have to check that out. Wow. I'll po- yeah, I'll send that one to you. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, that was a fun one. Cool, cool. Is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? I think that was everything. We talked about uh, C4SS stuff and mysticism. And yeah, I guess the, the last thing I want to say is that we might, hopefully, maybe, have a C4SS conference at some time in the coming year. So I'm, I'm working on that and I really want that to happen. Yeah. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Me too. That's that's really great. Yeah. Um, everyone keep an eye out for that. Alex McHugh, thank you so much for joining me. I had a, a, a tremendous time. I wish we had more time, but I know you're a busy person. You got uh, an interview with it's going down pretty soon. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, it's always great to get to talk about egoism and mysticism and, and all these things, which are a little weird, but you know, I, I, I think they're interesting and worthwhile discussions uh, for left-wing market anarchists. Definitely. All right, Alex. Well, thank you so much, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You too. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviummedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviummedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.